Well, we are in a, uh, in a series about giving and taking, gratitude. And one of the most important things that you and I can learn to do is to be like God. Do you realize God is a giving God? Everything God does comes from giving. In fact, the essence in the very beginning of the universe came from a giving God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Okay, Before the creation of the universe. I've been meditating on this for like the last couple of months. And I've been thinking about it more and more and how amazing it is, the love of God. You have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, right? Before there was anything else, it said, let us make. And they were together. And the Son would love the Father, would give. And the Son would receive and give thanks. And it was just like this constant, like a nuclear fusion, if you will, a fusion of God's love that would continue to expand and grow to the point where he made the universe. The most powerful force in the universe is the love of God found through Jesus Christ. And the love is more powerful than the universe. And it all comes from the standpoint of giving. For God so loved the world, he gave. It's all about giving. And we've been talking about givers and takers. And there really is basically two types of people in the world, givers and takers. We'll get into the other and fakers. Givers and takers. It reminds me of a story I've heard of a, a very wealthy man, a multimillionaire. He had a couple of friends that were with him at his deathbed, and he asked them a strange request. He was very materialistic, and he had a, a pastor was there, a, a doctor was there, and a lawyer. And he said, listen, guys, I have, I'm going to give you $3 million, $1 million each. But I'm going to ask you to do one thing for me. Like what? I want you to drop the million dollars of cash in the casket at my funeral because I'm going to die pretty soon. They're like, that's kind of a weird request. So and it, he passed away. The guys went to the funeral, the doctor, the lawyer, and the preacher. So now about a week or two goes by. They're together. And, and all of a sudden, they're having a cup of coffee together. And the pastor's kind of, guys, i got to be honest. I'm really struggling with something. I thought it was a ridiculous request to put a million dollars into the casket of cash. And I know there's this orphanage in India that's rescuing people, and they needed $250,000. So, guys, I, I did it. I, I only put $750,000 in the casket. I put two fifty dollars towards India. All of a sudden, the doctor's starting to sweat. Like, oh, man. Guys, there was a cancer ward for children. It needed $750,000. And I just thought it was ridiculous. So I, I gave one hundred fifty. I gave seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I only put two hundred fifty thousand dollars in the casket. All of a sudden, the lawyer's angry. I can't believe you guys. You a pastor lying like that? You a doctor? Let me tell you. I gave a million dollars. I wrote a check and put it right in the coffin. <laughs> Boy, that went well. It's like a Charlie Brown joke. Like a lead balloon, that went nowhere. Let me take a drink of water. Let me make it very clear. But there are people that way. No matter what happens, they always want to get the best, right? They always want to take from people. And they always find a way to extract from you. And there are basically two types of people in the world. There's takers and givers. You see, a giver always wants to leave a place better. A giver is kind of a person that goes into a restaurant and sees that the table is dirty will clean it before for another person. Uh, a person who's a giver might pick up a piece of garbage uh, and, and throw it away. A, a, a giver might be in a subway in New York City and the only seats there, he'll give it to somebody else. A giver is someone that when you meet them, you feel better about yourself. These are people that give. They often do it with humility and an act of grace. They just want to leave a place better than they found it. You know, people like that, you spend time like, man, that, I just feel better by being with this person. I, I've had the opportunity to go to the hospitals as people that were passing away in hospice, and I, I felt encouraged by them talking to me. It's like, this person is so amazing. And then there's people that are takers. I call them suckers. Okay, these are, these are suckers. They suck the life, and anywhere they go, they take all the oxygen out of the room. You know people like this, you spend some time with them, and you just leave depleted. Like, I am exhausted. I need to take the day off, <laughs> right? You hang out with these, some of these people. You spend time with them, and, and there's keep on. They want all this, and they're always upset. They're always putting something on social media. They're set, and, and, and the funny thing about the social media, they won't mention your name, but they'll dance around it, and everyone knows they're talking about you. 
These type of people, right? They twist everything you say. Everything that you do is about them and they feel offended by everybody. The world owes them. Well, a giver realized no one owes me anything. I have the privilege to give. And, and really the taker mentality is I, me, mine, every story, they're the central cast member, you are support cast. Every single situation you talk about with them, pretty much, it's all about them. I'm offended. I'm this. I'm the yeah. And it's, it's exhausting. And even when they are generous, it's for a reason. They do something to try to get something out of you. You see, the Bible says the man looks at the outside, but the Lord looks at the heart. So even in their generosity, they want to get something out of you. Now, see people are saying, I know exactly who this is. It's probably you, by the way. But there's the carnal way. And the carnal way is givers and takers. They give so they can take. My, you know, they'll do something for you that way. Then there's the givers and the matchers. And this is kind of like, this seems reasonable to me. If you do this, I'll do that, right? And I'd say the majority of people are that way. There are more of the matchers. There are people who give. And that's all they want to do. I know people like that in this church. They're amazing. They always want to give. There are others that want to match. But then this is what happens. But there are givers and there are matchers and there are people that give to get something out of it. In fact, they like to celebrate how benevolent they are. In fact, Jesus had a hard time with religious people. And these Pharisees, this is what he says. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law? For you Pharisees, hypocrites. Hypocrite means putting a mask on. That's actually where the Greek word comes from, from the theatrical plays. They'd have a bunch of different masks with the same actors. It's faking it. You hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe. Tithe is 10%. And in Jewish law, 10% is what they were often, uh, they would give. In fact, most Jewish scholars believe that 23% of a Jewish person's income went towards the religious exercising of the temple or the synagogue. So tithing, by the way, came before the law. The first person to tithe, and we know about in Scripture, was Abraham, who tithed to Melchizedek after he um, had all this tremendous wealth, the prince of Salem, the priest of Salem, and it's a, far, it's a shadow of who Jesus Christ is, has no beginning, no end. And then we see his descendants also tithing. So it came before the law. So these Pharisees are like, I'm going to tithe. But the problem is, he says the following, you ignore the most important aspects of the law. They tithe on their own spices. But you ignore the most important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Look what Jesus says about tithing. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. And there are places in Scripture where Jesus was really giving it to the Pharisees who said this, hey, listen, you need to give to the temple. Forget about your parents. Take care of the temple. And I would say, if you have a mother or father home and sick, and you'd rather give to the church, please take care of your own family first. I believe in tithing, but offerings. And so they wanted it for themselves. It's kind of a sick way. So basically, there are givers and takers, and, and there are givers and matchers, and then there's God's way. God's way is the best way. Frankly, it's the only way, and it gives you life. It's called giver's and receivers. I give and I receive with thanksgiving. I give and I receive with thanksgiving. Even when I'm given something, I thank God for it. Can I just say I'm thankful for you all? I'm thankful that you want to hear about God. I'm thankful that you care enough to come together and say, I need more God in my life because you know what? I need more God in my life too. And it's a wonderful thing when we can give and receive Give and receive. You see, how do you know if you're giving and receiving? If you're giving and receiving and you go to a Christmas party and you walk out and, and you feel insecure, no one's going to like me. Does my outfit look good enough? Am I as good as the other person? You have a taker mentality because you're thinking about what everyone thinks about you. But if you go into a party or a family outing and you want, I want to be a blessing to someone and how can I make this place a better place? The anxiety goes away. So really, everybody... Beginning a giver and a receiver is an invitation for mental health. It's an invitation for happiness. It may be disappointing at times. 
People may disappoint you, but it sets you free. And when you suffer for the right reason, God suffers with you. And I'm telling you, it's so much better. You know, it feels good to give. It does. Can I be honest? It might be a little bit selfish, but I love giving to other people and being a blessing. It just feels good. Why? It feels good because that's your design. Your design is to bless other people. And when you, when you bless someone else, it's like, aha, this is what I'm called to do. I'm like a bird on the, I'm like an eagle on the thermal draft. I'm just flying high because I've been made to be like God. And God is a giver, not a taker. So we are givers and receivers. And, and Jesus even said, he said the following, he said, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve others and to what? Give his life as a ransom for many. God died for you. He loves you. He gave it everything. The Bible says, while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. I've heard people say this. Well, when she gives me respect, then I'll. When he, then I'll. Nope. God was the initiator. If you're married, be the initiator. Be the initiator for forgiveness. If you've got friends, be the initiator. We're not talking about abuse here. I'm talking about stop waiting for someone else to do it. That's the diminishing law of returns. You're not going to have a good return that way. You have to sow generosity to receive generosity. You have to sow kindness to receive kindness. And that's how you works. So the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know what the Bible says also this? Jesus said to him, it's more blessed to give than receive. I can honestly tell you, it is more blessed to give than receive. But how many folks know I like to receive too? <laughs> right? We like to receive. But listen, when it's all about I need this, I need this, I need this, it's the law of diminishing returns. It's never enough. But when you receive with thanksgiving, you are glad that what you have and you may not reach the pinnacle yet, but you learn to be content in every circumstance. The apostle Paul says, I've learned how to be content in much and not. I've learned to give thanks to God in all things. I may not be where I want to be eventually, but I thank God I'm not where I used to be. I thank God that I'm here today. And some of you are so concerned about trying to find the purpose of your life or trying to retire or trying to find the right job or trying to find the right mate or whatever, that you're so focusing on that, you don't even enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey. Thank God for where you are. And when you thank God and you're grateful, you know what it does? It attracts God's blessings to you. And it is, a, it is a, basically an antidote against the enemy. The enemy hates people that are thankful. It's like wearing mosquito repellent. But it doesn't smell bad. That's why I don't wear it. So this is what it's all about. You see, there's giving, there's giving for taking is a life that's faking and flaking. I can't help but rhyme it all the time. <laughs> giving for taking is a life that's faking and flaking. You keep on giving to somebody and you're faking it and you receive, it's a flaking thing. What happens is your internal core of who you are as a man and a woman flakes away. You become a flake, not a snowflake, but a flake. Because I'm always taking, you're faking and you're flaking, and you never gather, you scatter inside your hearts. And the presence of God, and you're always upset, uptight, frustrated, anxious. I'm telling you right now, a lot of psych characters would go out of business if people would just learn to be givers. I recognize there are people out there that have chemical imbalances, and we're not disdaining people that have legitimate medical health problems. But there are people that have diabetes. And, and how many folks know if you are diabetic, eating a Twinkie and a fudge round is not a good idea, right? So you can change your diet and help it and even still take medication. And plus, God can heal. I want to make that very clear because a lot of people feel guilty for having struggles with anxiety and depression. God loves you and you're not a bad person. I just need to say that. So giving and receiving is real life living and God pleasing. Man, when you're pleasing God, it's amazing, everybody. It's both now and forevermore. You can take it with you. Whatever you do for God in worship, 
and generosity, you have both now and forevermore. People say you can't take it with you. Yes, you can. You can store up riches in heaven by giving with the right motivation. But whatever you do for now stays here. Let me give you an example about this. What does it look like to be a giver? How many of you have heard of the man Joseph? One of the most famous and the most wonderful bio stories in the Bible, true story, is found in Genesis chapters 37 through 50. Joseph was the beloved son. He was his father's favorite. Can I just tell you right now from the Bible, do not have favorites if you have kids. Okay? My parents always treated us equally, even though I was their favorite. I have no favorites, right? I remember when we had Luke, my wife and I, I'm like, uh, I'm a little worried about having Hannah before she was Hannah, because we didn't know yet. I, I don't, I'm afraid I might not love her as much as Luke. And, and guess what happened when Hannah was born? God gave me another chamber in my heart. And then when Matthew, another chamber in my heart. And I can honestly tell you that Luke is my favorite firstborn son. <laughs> Absolutely, and Hannah's my favorite daughter. Absolute, and Matthew's my favorite third-born son. But seriously, having this sibling rivalry is horrible. And so they were jealous of Joseph because Joseph was a goody two-shoes. He did everything right. He had a coat of many colors. But basically, in other words, he had the, he had the, uh, he had the Mercedes G-Wagon. And the rest of the guys were driving Hyundai Elantras. So, yeah, he had it good. He had the nice threads. And, and, and he was a good guy. And he basically said, hey, guys, I had a dream that I'm going to rule over you all. Now, now, Joseph was not trying to be braggadocious. He was honestly telling his dream. But the Bible says, do not put your pearls before swine, lest they stamp on, on it. Sometimes the best thing you can do when God tells you something is keep your mouth shut because people want to take it and abuse it. So they hated this guy. They could not stand him. And one day they saw him coming. Oh, here comes the dreamer. So they conspired to kill him. And one said, no, 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 don't kill him. Let's sell him to slavery. So they threw him in a pit. The Bible says he was, he was pleading for his brothers. Please, guys, don't do this. They didn't care. They sold him to the traveling band of people. And he went to Egypt. And he got sold to a guy named Potiphar. Potiphar was the captain of, of the guard of, of uh, Pharaoh, a big, a big cheese, if you will, in Egypt. And so what do you think? Joseph would have done, this stinks, man. Here, I'm trying to serve God. I do everything for God, and look where I am. This stinks. I hate being a slave. I'm going to check in. I'm going to check in late and check out early. I don't care about this. This stinks. I'm a slave. This is horrible. I don't belong here. This is the wrong place. My brothers, he didn't get bitter. He got better. And some of you and some of me, <laughs> often, sometimes I get bitter instead of getting, but he got better. And this is one of the most beautiful phrases in his story. It's mentioned four times, and here it is. The Lord was with Joseph. So he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of the Egyptian master, Potiphar. So here he is, rising from the ranks, just a normal slave, but he did his work unto the Lord. The Bible says in the New Testament, and even told slaves, obey your masters, I know. And it also said, do the work unto the Lord. Do it under God. Do your best, and God say, will take care of it. And it says, the Lord was with Joseph. When his master saw what? The Lord was with him, and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did. He put him over his entire house. So now you have a louse becoming in charge of the entire house. You have a guy that's at the bottom is now in the second in command in Potiphar's house. The Bible says Potiphar had no worries at all except what he's going to eat. Now, man, that's what you call good help. Can I hear, Lord, send some more in Jesus' name? Right? We all want that. Loyalty. So this is what happened. But one time, Potiphar had a wife named Potiphar. She was the cat's meow, or the, well, actually, the dog's bark. She was a good-looking young lady. The Bible says she was good-looking. And the Bible also says that Joseph, like your pastor, is a very handsome man. That's why I wear a jacket to hide my one-pack. <laughs> so 
She desired him every day. She tried to find an opportunity to talk to him. And finally she said to him, hey, come sleep with me. And think about it. Joseph's been through a lot of trouble. He has an opportunity now to sleep to the top. This woman, if I sleep with her, I'm going to have favor. She'll probably put me in a new movie. Yeah, things are going to go well. If I sleep with her, after all, I'm a man. I've been through a lot. You know what? I deserve this. It's not fair what I've been through. And this woman can help me along my way. That's what, what does he say? What does Joseph say? He said the following. No one has more authority than I do. He talks about her husband. He has held back nothing from me except you. Because you are his wife. I don't know what's wrong but it feels so right. No, that's not what he said. He said, how could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. His life was not his own. He knew his job was to glorify God and to be a great example of what a godly man is. And he said, no, all three of you. But then one day she grabbed him, said, come lie with me. And so he sat down with her and said, let's think about this for a moment. I'm attracted to you. You're attracted to me. We shouldn't. No, he didn't do that. Don't negotiate with sex. Run from it. Sex outside of marriage and twisted sex. Sex in marriage is fantastic and wonderful. It's a great thing. We'll talk about it in a new year. We're going to have a whole series on it because 1 Corinthians talks about it in great detail, but it will be PG, sort of. So seriously, and so he ran. He didn't negotiate with it. The Bible says, no temptation has seized you, but what is common to man, and God is faithful, will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with every temptation will provide an avenue of escape that you may be able to bear it. In other words, he gives you an ejection seat in the fighter. You have to plan your escape before you're there. You don't plan your escape in the backseat of a car. You don't plan your escape in a motel room. You say, I'm getting out before it gives me trouble. And sometimes the best thing you can do is run from sexual temptation. Why? Because it has devastating effects. God forgives and renews, but there's collateral damage. I'm telling you, I've seen it my whole life. How can I do such a wicked thing? So what happens now to Joseph? He gets thrown in prison. Great, God. I'm serving God. I do everything. I'm nice. I help people. I, now I'm in prison. This stinks. Forget it, God. I'm giving up on God. God doesn't exist. I'm going to deconstruct. And what does he do? He does his best in prison. He's the best prisoner there. He rises up in the Cheshire Correctional. Next thing you know, the Bible says, but what? The Lord was with Joseph in prison. You know, the Lord is with you right now and whatever you're going through, know he's with you. He sees you. You have to trust him. You learn to be a giver, not a taker and a complainer. But the Lord was with Joseph in prison and showed him faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care. Because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success and whatever he did. So here you have a lowly prisoner. The next thing you know, he's driving the boss's car. He's walking around the prison and he's it. He controls the whole place. Why? He gained by serving. Now, what's so amazing is you think he'd walk around and go, these prisoners, a bunch of low lowlifes. You see, and one day he's walking through the, the ward and he sees these two guys. And they're like, they're like shaking in their boots. They seem destitute and depressed and fearful. And so what does Joseph do? I don't need to bother with them. I get better things. No, he says, you know what? I care about people. They look at it. Something's wrong with them. He goes over to them. Hey, what's going on with you? You seem a little frustrated. And they say, yeah, we had a dream last night. The baker and, and the um, cupbearer. And so he says, uh, well, God answers dreams. Let me, let me hear it. He didn't say, well, <clears throat> I'm in charge of the whole prison here. What can I do for you? No, he didn't do that. He didn't do that. What he did 
is he really cared about them. And then he told them the dreams, what they meant. God gave him the example of it. The baker, by the way, was going to die. And the, um, the cupbearer was going to live. And so the Bible says, then he got out of prison and told Pharaoh, no, nope, it didn't happen. He felt forgotten again. I got paid. I did the right thing, and everything goes wrong. But God saw. And one day, Pharaoh had a dream that disturbed him. And all of a sudden, the, the cupbearer goes, wait a minute, I know a guy. I love that. I know a guy. I know a guy. He can take care of that. And sure enough, they grabbed Joseph. Joseph took a shower, shaved, went before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh goes to him, I understand you can interpret dreams. He says, no, God can. Tell me your dream. And then he became the second in command in the most powerful dynasty at that time. Why? Because he understood that God was with him. And he served God and gave worship and received thanksgiving no matter where. How do you know he was thankful? He would have never been able to survive with it. Almost reminds me of a story I read. Richard Rumbrand, if I say his name correctly, Tortured for Christ, talks about while he was in prison camp, in the in prison camp, what he did is he actually tithed on the moldy bread. He gave it to the one that was the weakest, and he thanked God for what he had. This is the, what we're talking about here. So that's an amazing example. You want to know what a giver is? That's what a giver and a receiver is. Can you see how it can elevate you to a higher place when you're doing it for the right location and the right reasons? In fact, there was a guy by the name of Barney. You know Barney, the purple dinosaur? No, not that one. There was a guy named Barnabas. And uh, I tell you, let's just read about this guy Barnabas in the book of Acts. One of the apostles' nickname was Barnabas, which means an S-O-E. A son of encouragement. Now listen, look at your neighbor and say, you're an SOE. Or DOE, if you're a daughter of encouragement. Wouldn't you like to be known as an SOE or DOE? He was a son of encouragement. You know, I, I, how many people know this? You can have the greatest time in the world. And someone comes in the room and just poof, they blow the whole thing up. This guy comes in and makes you feel better about yourself. So, he was called the son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. Now check this out. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. The Bible says in the very beginning of the church, no one had any need. They all helped each other out. So Barnabas saw a need. What did he do? He sold his field and brought the entire 100% proceeds and he laid it at, his, at the apostles' feet. He did it with the right intentions. You see, the Bible says, let your good deeds be seen before men that they would glorify your Father in heaven. There are other times in the Bible says, do not let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. It's a matter of the heart. So what did he do? He brought the money to the apostles and everyone knew about it. Well, there was this couple named Ananias and Sapphira. And uh, hey, what's this guy Barney? What's going on with this guy Barney? Why is he getting all the accolades here? Hey, we're wealthy. We got a lot of money. Now, some scholars, and they look into it. It seems that Ananias and Sapphira were well-to-do, had a lot of money. So what did they do? They sold their land and gave money to the church, and um, some scholars believe it was more than what Barney gave. But they kept some back for themselves. But they lied and said they gave the full amount. Why? Because they were giving to take, not giving to receive. And what happened? Well, he brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was full of amount. This is uh, Ananias. With his wife's consent, at least he has that kind of wisdom, get his wife's consent. All the men are going, amen. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest, but lied. Then Peter said to him, Ananias, why have you let Satan... Satan's always knocking on our door. We, the devil doesn't make you do anything. You let him in. Stop blaming the devil and stop blaming God and take personal responsibility. Can I hear, oh, no. The Peter said to Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit and kept some of the money for yourself. And he died like that. Then three hours later, his wife comes. She lies. She dies like that. Whoa. 
What's the story with that? Why would God be so judgmental? And so, well, I'll tell you the reason why. Too much is given, much is required. Do you realize the anointing on the church at that time? The Bible says Peter's shadow, people were getting healed with Peter's shadow. The church was at a high voltage. If you're an electrician, you have high voltage and high ampage. You better be very careful. The locomotive of the church of God was flying through that area, and there's a third rail. And you got to be very careful crossing that track not to touch that third rail. And see, sometimes the reason why God doesn't give us the anointing and the privilege some of the early church had, because he knows if we had it, we'd squander it and hurt ourselves. You don't give a child a brand new car if they're driving their bicycle irresponsibly. So, what happened here? Now, this story is like incredible, but I can tell you a modern day story, relatively modern. I went to Regent University, and my professor of church history and spiritual gifts was Dr. Peter Prosser. Dr. Peter Prosser tells a story when he was an Episcopal priest. He had a parish, and there was a guy in the church. His mother passed away. And he wanted to donate, I don't know how much, a significant amount of money to the church. But there was one caveat. He wanted to say, in memory of my mother, given by his guy's name. Let's call him Jack. Jack don't know Jack, right? So Jack wanted to have that. And Peter said, no, we can't, you can't do that. Uh, if you want to give, you can give. We don't do that at this church. We're not going to put your name on the, on the wall. He says, well, that's not right. I should do it. Nah, said, don't, we're not going to allow that here. So he goes away. On vacation for two weeks, uh, Pastor Pro Pro Prosser, or um, Dr. Prosser, he comes back after two, two weeks or so, and guess what's on the wall? They got a plaque saying the guy's mother and his name. He takes it down, calls the guy into his office with a couple other leaders. They say, what are you doing? I told you not to do that. I'm gonna, you can't have that. Well, then I'm taking my money back, and I'm leaving the church. And Peter goes, this, he says, yeah, you're right. You're not going to set, he says, I'm not going to set foot back in this church. And Peter goes, yes, you will, feet first. A short while after, the man's casket came into the church. Now, is that a true story? I don't think my professor was a liar. Can I just say that I've seen in my own parents' life, being pastors, when they honored the Lord and people have went against them in a wrong way, God took care of it. That's all I have to say. Be careful. Don't mess with the presence of God like that. This is why God withholds sometimes the supernatural power he has available to all believers because he knows we can't handle it because we're all about taking. See, Jesus said it very clear. No one can serve two masters. For either you hate the one and love the other or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And just to save some time, mammon, some people believe is a Greek, it was a God they would worship, a God of materialism. You cannot serve God in greed. You cannot serve God in greed. And so this is what Jesus says. You have to love one and hate the other. He says how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's like a camel going through an eye of a needle, he says. And the Bible says in Timothy, it says, it says the following. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money, but the love of and the worship of. Now, Benjamin Franklin said something very profound. I'm paraphrasing. Benjamin Franklin says, life, he says, time is the stuff life is made of. Time is the stuff life is made of, right? Without time, you have no life. So think about it. Time equals life, right? And so what do you do when you work? You give your time to your boss. You give your time, which equals your life, to your boss, and what does the boss do? Pays you. So we have here time plus work equals money. Therefore, money equals life. It represents your life. It's an amazing test that God asks us to try me, test me. He asks us to be generous what he's given us because it's not ours in the first place. It's his. And so think about it. One of the biggest spiritual tests who is ruling your life is how do you spend your money? Even people who don't work, someone gave their life to get that money. And so money represents your life. So an amazing test is how do you spend the money that God has stewarded you? That's a good question. So time equals life. Time plus work equals money. Money equals your life in many ways. How you sow is how it goes. 
How you sow is how it goes. Bible's very clear about this. You know, the Apostle Paul says about giving. Listen, everybody. We don't give to get. We give to give. He says the following. He says, not as a grudging obligation. Don't give out of obligation. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. So when she gives me respect, no. You show first. You give first. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So do you want to be blessed or not? Listen, everything I have is from God. So the first thing that comes out of the check I receive, it goes right to tithing immediately. Our church tithes 10% of everything we get in. It goes outside of this church to bless another mission, some other ministry, because we believe in tithing. Not because we can get rich, because we recognize it's the beginning point. It's a starting point. It's the training wheels of giving. The Bible says, all a man seems, all the way, a man's ways seem innocent to him, but motives are weighed by the Lord. We don't give to get. And you can tithe and give with the wrong motivation to God. No, God, if you, this is a hard one to say. If you've never done another thing for me, by you dying on the cross and giving me the gift of salvation. How could I top that? How could I not give back everything to you? And yet the Bible says the following, will a man rob God? This comes from Malachi. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 23, 23, you should tithe. Will a man rob God? What is a tithe? Tithe literally means 10%. Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with the curse. Oh, here we go again. Legalism. No, let me tell you something. When you're serving money, it's a curse. Who's my God? Money. Is money going to help you out? Ultimately, no. It's a curse. You see, what happens with a curse is the consequences for your action give a reaction that will hurt you. It's called a curse. It's not like God's going, ha, ha, ha. They're not tithing. Go send them some. Go get them fleas. No, that's not what he does. Get him fleas so he's on his knees. No, that's not what it's about. I can't help but rhyme all the time. Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. But you say, in what way? In tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. That's the local assembly. And the Bible says, put away aside something for the first day of the week. It talks about the New Testament. That there, listen, we don't demand it. This is called grace giving, not legalism. Not legalism. This is called grace giving. And try me, says, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing. The Hebrew word for blessing does not mean cars and mansions and yachts. You know what it means? Peace. You can have all the money in the world and have zero peace. My peace I give you, not as the world gives. That's what Jesus says. So when you trust God, you may not have a Lexus. You may not have a Rolex. You may not have a G-Wagon. But you know what you're going to have? You're going to have peace with God. That's what we're talking about here. Will he bless you materially? Maybe, maybe not to the degree you think. That's not what it's about. He says, there will not be enough room to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. So you actually, it, it, it almost like kind of waterproofs you from the enemy. The enemy is always trying to get a, a loophole to get in there, and God's like, can't touch him. My favorite, you know my favorite verse in the Bible uh, that's in the extra biblical, uh, Bucci 3.18 says, you can't touch it. <laughs> da, 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 da. Okay. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit in all your fields, says the Lord of hosts. And all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. They've done study after study, and this is what they found. The most happy, well-adjusted people are people who have a benevolent attitude, who are givers and not takers. Why? We're made in the image of God. I like what the stud said. There's a reason why they call him C.T. Stud. One life to live will soon pass. Only what is done for Christ will last. So what are we going to be, givers or takers? I want to encourage you. We're going to be, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a legacy offering. There is no, no pressure at all. This is what you ask you to do. Ask God, God, what should I give? And listen to the Holy Spirit. 
I'm not going to tell you what to give. You ask God, and you, tell, and you, you do what he asks you to do. That's all I'm asking you guys. I don't believe in all this manipulation stuff. But we want to give a legacy offering to help Project Rescue, to rescue sex traffickers off the street, their children. We want to help local ministries. We also want to plan, I'll talk more about it next week, about the expansions of what we're trying to do here as God expands our, our footprint in this place, what we can do to make more of an impact for Christ. And that's all part of it. But you know the amazing thing is? Jesus said the following. Jesus said, he said, no one takes my life. I freely give it. Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners. He does not force himself upon you, but he loves you so much. My question to you is, do you believe that Jesus is the son of God? Great. But have you sacrificed your life and say, God, it's not my life who lives, but Christ who lives in me. You're not saved if you only believe in Jesus. I hear a lot of people say, well, I'm a Christian and there's no fruit. There should be fruit eventually. Have you actually given your life to God or do you still call the shots? If you're calling the shots, you're probably not saved. You're a person who enjoys and likes Christian philosophy. Christian philosophy does not save you. Surrender to God Almighty through the person and the work of Jesus does save you. No matter who you are, are, no matter what you've done. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes. How many of you would say here today, Pastor, I've never given my life to Jesus? Or if I did, I've, I've gone the wrong way. I want to get right today. I want to give my life back to Jesus. I've fallen away. And I want to get right. Can we be real men and real women here today and be honest? How many would say today, you know what? I want to give my life back to God. Or I've never given my life to God, but today is the day. Can I see a quick show of hands? Anyone did? Thank you. Anybody else? Just keep your hands up until I see it. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's pray this prayer together in our heart. I see that. In your heart, Lord Jesus. All right, say to the Lord, Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. Today, I step down from being in charge of my life. I declare you are God and I am not. Come into my life. Forgive me of all of my sins. Thank you based upon what you did on the cross and my belief and confession that you are the Lord. I am now a child of God. Come fill my life, Holy Spirit, and lead and guide me in Jesus' name.